What's up, guys? Brandon with Strict Vision Athletics. Welcome to this episode of Becoming the 1% Podcast. So my guest today is Jeremy Miller. He's the owner of Stronger, Faster, Further. Today, we're going to discuss endurance running. We're going to talk about the do's and don'ts as far as what sort of training implementation do you guys want to do? How is your recovery when it comes to the actual activity? And then ultimately, what are you doing to better yourself as time goes on, both physically and mentally? I hope you guys enjoy it. This episode of Becoming the 1% Podcast. Got entrepreneurial. We got some really big things coming. You have to have the willingness. It's an A or B. Try and use it as a tool. This is phenomenal. On details make up a person. It's what we believe in the industry. Jeremy, thanks for coming on, buddy. Thanks for having me on. I'm yeah. stoked to be here. Welcome. Yeah. Thank Us you. too, man. This is great. Which one? Is this two or three this week? How many podcasts have we done? Uh, I think number two. Yeah, number we did two? one yesterday. Yeah. Now, How long have you guys been doing this? The podcast. Eli. When was just episode? over a year? Just over a year. Nice. Yeah, same. I, I started yeah. mine like last April, so that coming was, up on a year. That was definitely going to be something I wanted to talk about. I mean, we're both doing this, and you're doing it really well. What was it that inspired you to start a podcast? I wanted to do it for so long, but I was always so scared of it. Really? I've just putting myself on camera speaking. I never thought of myself as a good speaker. Really? And I was like. Oh, people are going to judge me. I'm not going to talk right. I'm going to be too in my head about it. So I didn't do it for so long. Uh, I've been listening to Rogan since I was not the earliest guy, obviously, but maybe like 2015, 2016. Sure. Uh, sure. Before we got like super, super big. And I always thought it'd be so cool to have a podcast, yeah. but I was just too scared to do it. And then um, once I started creating more content like Instagram, YouTube, mm -hmm. got more comfortable in front of the camera, that's when I was like, okay, podcast is just another arm of that media side of things. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I started last April, so coming up on a year. Good for you, man. That's great. Even the timeline's kind of aligned. It's funny you say that you get or got nervous around the idea of because you wouldn't tell now. That's what's so so great about seeing somebody flourish and change and grow is that if I, if I watch your content today, I would never think, oh, that guy was super nervous, didn't want to do a podcast. Like you, You've got a good organic presence yeah. on your... Speaking of social media, is there anything else you want us to pull up other than just your Instagram? Um, no, I kind of cross-pollinate everything. So yeah. the YouTube uh, has maybe some more unique, just like the long-form stuff, but it's all relatively the same. It's Sweet. all fitness, running, lifting, eating. Perfect. All the same kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, the podcast has become honestly probably one of my favorite forms of content that I create. Why? Because it's not about me. It's a, I get to just learn about other people. Isn't that the truth? It's all just like inquisitive uh, conversations with people that I find interesting. Yeah. And uh, I, I like chatting with people sometimes that don't have a lot of followers or that don't have the clout necessarily because mm -hmm. they're just regular, real people, just like the rest of us. And they don't have like some agenda they're trying to push. And it's just like learning their story and hearing yeah. about what they do and, and their unique experience mm -hmm. and just gaining a new perspective is so powerful, I think. And so, so, so well said. Yeah. And being able to uh, refine my own conversational skills and like mm -hmm. being an active listener. Like the first few episodes were so bad. Oh my like, gosh. Dude. <laughs> don't even get me started. We, he and I shot the first episode we ever did three times in a row over two days because mm -hmm. we kept messing up the audio. But when we finally got one that we loved and then we ran with it, I went back and watched it. I couldn't watch it. It was <laughs> It was unwatchable. <laughs> Couldn't land points. I, 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 I stuttered as I spoke. I didn't have any. It was just totally disorganized. It was totally disorganized. And it, it almost made me shut the entire thing down. I was like, man, oh, wow. maybe I'm just not meant to do this. It just wasn't like a free-flowing conversation. It, it was... And it's like too training. robotic. Yeah, it's like it's like learning how to train a muscle correctly. Yeah. It's right. like learning how to run. It, you probably you're not going to do a 50 mile run the first time you try to run, but <laughs> it's you do reps, you keep going, and you do get better at it. And speaking, it's funny because people the fear of public speaking is greater than almost any other in human existence. Yeah, and there's a reason for that. The ability to coherently communicate and get your points across, especially in front of a large audience is not something that comes naturally to almost anyone. And I think there's a small percentage of that that does carry over, even if you're just alone in front of your phone or with one other person in your platform. Being able to communicate and then, as you put it, be an active listener. Being an active listener is probably the thing I struggled with the most. I can usually talk my way in and out of any conversation, but learning to stop speaking and listen and actually listen and then come up with a response as yeah. it's going. That was hard for me because of ADD, frankly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> frankly. It's hard because you start thinking about maybe a question you want to ask, but then they 
keep expanding on another idea mm -hmm. and you got to pivot and like you got to always be paying attention to what they're saying yeah mm -hmm. it takes a lot of presence i think mm -hmm. and that was uh, the first few episodes i did it was very interviewee like i had a list of questions i tried to stick to the questions too much and I was like, oh, listening back, I should have gone deeper down there, asked them a follow-up question. Yeah. And uh, it just didn't feel as natural. So. And sometimes that's where the biggest gold nuggets come from or is, is the like yeah. the follow-on questions or digging deeper into certain subjects. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, that's why Rogan is, I mean, the best podcaster is because it's pure conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much he prepares. It, it, some guests maybe more than others, but yeah. it doesn't seem like he prepares too much. And it's just like, oh, I'll find it out during the episode. I'll just ask and learn about it during the episode. I, I kind of take that approach, I guess, because it mm -hmm. makes it more organic, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. And you put it once, it's free mentorship. Yeah. Having people on that are outside of your wheelhouse, so, especially a guest. I mean, to me, the guests that I love the most are the ones that it's a topic of conversation that I know nothing about. Something weird, something that is off, even something that's entirely outside of fitness. Uh, we we had an episode this week where we had a uh, baller busters on where they came on and they talked about workspace integrity on on the internet and and the uh, scams that are going on and stuff and, and I mean stuff like that that's a good example of something where I mean I'm not versed in I'm not a lawyer I don't have any background in exactly how that sort of thing would transpire but it's cool to be able to speak with somebody that does right yeah those are my favorite too like I had a uh, gal on last week we talked about mushrooms like like functional mushrooms and for just like i mean it's kind of tied into health and fitness i guess but um i don't know i didn't know anything about mushrooms i was like i want to talk to this lady learn about mushrooms i thought it was cool yeah Be beyond i assume beyond just the psychedelic nature of them she she was discussing yeah. the, the actual health of mushrooms right how many different because there's a bunch you just did a podcast on this so i'm sure there's a lot right i mean i think there's I don't want to say millions, maybe it's millions, thousands of species of mushrooms, but mm -hmm. kind of the main like functional adaptogens they're called. So like cordyceps, reishi, mm -hmm. chaga, like the stuff for your immune system, lion's mane for your brain. Yeah. Nootropics. Exactly. Almost always contain a mushroom of some kind. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think so. Yeah. I know lion's mane is probably the main one for your brain. Mm -hmm. uh, cordyceps are great for endurance. So you were just talking about one, weren't you, Eli? Um, yesterday were you, no, was I wrong? Who yeah. was telling me? Someone was telling me about a, a I, I, was, I was telling you about a peptide. It wasn't a, had nothing to do with mushrooms. That's it. You mentioned. <laughs> I think you mentioned lion's mane as a nootropic. The, the the supplement you're talking about is a nootropic, and it's as a instead sure. of lion's no. Mane. You you brought up lion's mane. Did I? Yes. Oh well. <laughs> there had you go. Nothing to do with it. <laughs> yeah, man. So tell me about running. Tell me about how you got involved in this. Uh, what was your start like? Where did you first find a love for this? Yeah, I definitely wasn't always a runner. I always hated running. I played sports. I was always active. Uh, hockey and baseball were my mm -hmm. two main sports growing up. Uh, but once I was done playing sports in high school, uh, I was in college and I just felt kind of lost without having team sports and, you know, some practice to show up to every day. And, mm -hmm. and I just, I would like go to the gym and kind of like lackluster, lift some weights, didn't really have any intention with it. Uh, I was partying a lot, drinking, just like the typical college student and sure. i was like i feel like i'm missing something um and then i was listening to a rogan podcast heard this guy david goggins on there talk about his story of running 100 miles without training well on like a 24-hour notice and i'm like that's fucking crazy like <laughs> what if what if i could do that like what if i got into this endurance thing it just seemed like this hearing goggins specifically talk about using running and endurance sports as a way to like explore your your consciousness or explore your your human potential uh, it was just so fascinating to me. And so I started running just a mile a day. I would go out and run as hard as I absolutely could. I'd, I'd just try and set a new PR in the mile every day, basically, which is not the most ideal way to train, obviously. And uh, after about a year or two of doing that, I was like, okay, if I want to run further than a mile or two, I probably need to learn more about running, maybe slow down a little bit. So I started slowly listening to podcasts, absorbing some more information about running uh, this was all back in like 2018 is when mm -hmm. I first got into it. So what is that? Six years ago, five years ago. Um, and the first two years was just go run a mile a day, two miles a day. And then my first race was in 2020 and it was uh, a 12 hour endurance challenge is what it was called. So I had from 6 30 PM to 6 30 AM to run as many miles as I could. This is in the mountains in Wyoming where I grew up. Wow. And, uh, I was like, okay, David Goggins did a hundred miles in like 24 hours, maybe in 12 hours I could do 50 miles. That sounds pretty good. Uh, <laughs> never done more than like 10 miles at a time back then. But I was like, okay, let's see if we can run 50 miles. Why not? Uh, I ended up doing 43 miles within the 12 hours. So like not bad 
for my no, first race. Yeah. And, uh, but it gave me so much confidence of like, okay, I did that on very minimal, very terrible training. What mm-hmm. if I actually like really got obsessed with running? What if I did it the real way? Uh, and from there, I just got super obsessed with learning about running. And, uh, that's where I like, it, it gave me a lot of confidence just as a whole to, mm-hmm. to, uh, actually start training the right way. And so that's where I signed up for my first marathon. So I did, I did the ultra, the 43 mile run before my first marathon or half marathon or anything, uh, signed up for my first marathon, um, just all my own training for through what I found through the internet, ran three hours in one minute. I was trying to break three hours to qualify for the Boston marathon, missed it by 54 seconds. Uh, so that hurt a little bit. But you have to, I'm sorry, you have to run how yeah, far sorry. in th- to, to, to qualify sorry, for I the forget, Boston? You guys aren't runners, are you? No. <laughs> okay. So to qualify for Boston, uh, for my age and as a male, you have to run under three hours. So that's like six minutes, 50 seconds per mile. Okay. Uh, and I ended up running three hours and 54 seconds. So I missed it by 54 seconds wow. to break wow. three. So that's like two seconds a mile I was off basically. Got it. So that hurt uh to get that close and, and miss it by just that much and so I, I hired a coach and then like three months later i ran like 258 mm-hmm. so i qualified for boston that's like a, a pretty that's like one percent of runners can can qualify for boston so i was like damn i might actually be pretty good at this running thing mm-hmm. and that was 2022 so that was i didn't actually know that that the forward. boston marathon was so elite that only the top what you'd say top two to three percent of all runners yeah, can I, do it i think that is actually the percentage i think it's two percent okay of, of all marathon runners can qualify for Boston yeah. or per year, 2% of runners. It, it explains qualify. the hype. I didn't, I, I didn't know that, that the Boston marathon came with such a elite class. Yeah. And so it's like, I mean, there's levels to it. Cause then you have like the Olympic trials qualifier guys. There's like the elite, elite marathon runners. They'll run like two fifteen, two ten for the marathon. Jeez. So stupid fast. It's, it's like five <laughs> minutes a mile basically. Yeah. Um, Is but any, anyone going to break two? Uh, the guy that, Probably would have been the, the next person to do it or the first person to do it. He just died like a couple of weeks ago. Kip uh, His name's Kelvin Kiptum. Kiptum. He died? Yeah. How, wait, how did he die? Uh, in a car crash. In, uh, no. Wow. Yeah. So he was the guy that was coming up on Kipchoge, right? Yeah. He so was... he just set the world record in October. Dang. Yeah. He ran two, I did not hear that. He ran two hours, 35 seconds. Do, do you know any of the details on the car accident? I mean, was it... Uh, I I don't know a whole lot. I know it was him. His coach was in the car and died. Oh, uh, no. And then I think he had like a friend or something in the car who also passed away. Because um, he was a minute off of it, right? He was... Yeah, 30, 35 seconds. 35 seconds off of breaking yeah, two yeah. hours. The so, first person ever to do that. Wow. Yeah. A second per mile. And basically. he was young. He wasn't... He was 23. 20, or 24. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that sucks. He was a freak of nature. Like, he was on track to... Yeah. And so young. Record. And yeah. to die so suddenly for such a weird and unexpected reason. Oh, that's too yeah. bad. I didn't not know that it's almost identical you know steve prefontaine ran it like oregon the name yeah. yeah i know yep. the name back in the i think it was the 70s or 80s like when nike was getting big he was like one of the first nike athletes but yeah. uh he was 24 like training for the olympics or had just done the olympics or something and, and died in a car crash at 24 mm-hmm. like it was weird how similar they kind of were together but um yeah, yeah he probably would have been the first guy uh he, he'd only done three marathons kipped him mm-hmm. his third marathon he broke the world record which is just <laughs> insane so Dang. Uh, terrible yeah terrible way to go i I mean and with so much potential lost as well terrible no matter who it is but especially somebody so young and so full of potential yeah yeah you've mentioned several times that you ran a certain way without training and now you've had training and that's impacted the way that you're actually performing right what would you say is the because again i this is an area of sports science i really haven't dug into i'm not a marathon running or a marathon coach what is the proper way to periodize your training for long distance running. Yeah. Uh, to put it simply about 80% of your running should be very easy zone two heart rate, mm. just very easy miles, like conversational. You should be able to talk essentially like we are now get out full sentences, not breathing too hard. Mm. That should be 80% of the time. And then the other 20% that's like the interval training, high intensity, um, yeah, I, the eighty twenty rule is like pretty tried and true. High intensity, like we're doing wind sprints, we're doing suicides, that, yes. that kind of thing. So a typical, it kind of varies, but for a marathon build, a typical interval session will be, uh, say like six times a mile or eight times a mile, like at your half marathon pace or your ten k pace. So eight times a mile. What what does that mean? So that'd be like okay, uh, you go to the track, you run a mile mm-hmm. at, um, your your half marathon pace. Okay, and then you rest for a minute or two. Do it again a mile, rest for a minute or two. So just basic interval training, essentially. Yeah. Um, 
obviously depending on what distance you're training for whether it's 5k 10k half marathon marathon mm -hmm. uh that's where the intervals length might change so the longer the distance the longer the intervals are going to be mm -hmm. the longer distance you're training for the longer the intervals will be so um for marathon uh, there are benefits to doing the really short high intense stuff like a 400 meter repeat that's going to take you know a minute to a minute and a half mm -hmm. uh so close to like one on one off or you can do really long intervals or like what we call a tempo run where it's like six miles at your marathon pace that's like a really high intense effort or six miles at your half marathon pace even and what's so. your fastest six mile at that if you're going as hard as you can for six miles what's your fastest mile time um i've never actually done like an all-out six mile i guess but gotcha. uh so for example when i did my most recent marathon i ran 244 so that's mm -hmm. like six minutes 15 seconds per mile Jeez, so cruising yeah it's basically sprinting yeah <laughs> it yeah. is uh and so like a, a training session for that would probably be something like six six times a mile mm -hmm. uh and each one of those miles would be like at my half marathon pace, which would be like maybe six minutes per mile or like mm -hmm. 550 or something. Can you tell when you're doing it just by the feel of where your pace is at? You'd be like, all right, I'm at half marathon right now. Okay, now I'm going to drop it back down to full marathon pace. When you do it enough, you, you find an intuition yeah. for, for different paces. And, and I mean, there's calculators kind of like it's like a one rep max calculator. Okay, if you can bench this weight for five reps, your one rep max is probably around this. Yeah. It's mathematically kind of, you can run it out. Yeah. It's kind of the same way, um, for running it. I, I'd say the biggest metric you'd want to pay attention to is like your lactate threshold. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I can explain that. Yeah. If you know yeah. That. How, yes, please. For the, especially for the audience members don't understand what that means. Yeah. So, so lactate, uh, is a byproduct of, uh, fatigue basically. And mm -hmm. so the more you're working, the harder you're working, the more lactic acid that builds up in your muscles. There's all these byproducts that come with that. Essentially it's your, your brain's way of saying, okay, we're working really hard. Let's send out this, this byproduct, see if we can get this guy to slow down because he's mm -hmm. pushing too hard basically so yeah. once that builds up too much uh it your body can no longer clear the lactic acid out of your muscles so that's when you get that like brick feeling in your legs and it's like your legs just can't push anymore mm -hmm. so that's when you go over that point that's your lactate threshold yeah. and so for a marathon you want to be just under the lactate threshold uh for a half marathon you're kind of right on the line for a 10k you're probably over that line a little bit yep and it, it takes you can run at that lactate threshold pace for an hour to an hour and a half yeah um because at that point you're just you'll you'll push you'll too hard you, puke you, usually yeah you can't for those listening the end result of this pushing past the threshold is almost certainly you either pass out or throw up basically Typically, that's what happens yeah, it, yeah and i feel like i mean you can push as hard as you can and you're it, to some point your brain's probably going to say it. it's going to send out some signal like a cramp or mm -hmm. uh it'll it'll do something to prevent you from getting to that point <clears throat> sometimes or it'll make you throw up and then yeah. it's like okay this is how we got him to stop running so uh yeah the lactate yeah. threshold is probably one of the biggest indicators for for marathon or just general running fitness i think because everything can kind of be dictated off of that it's definitely something that while i don't do long distance marathon running or training i've done a lot of uh rucking hiking very advanced arizona in particular has a lot of crazy incline mountains around here and a lot of them typically they range anywhere from two to four miles it's just you're climbing the empire state building or you're and, and for me that's that's always been where i found the most enjoyment for cardiovascular is i first off i love being in nature i love being outside i want to be in an area where i can get my shirt off i can get you know in touch i can get grounded all of that good stuff happens and you add in elevation change or anything like that, but it's the same for me. I, I can tell for me, I, I put it in terms of like, all right, I got it in first. All right. I'm going to get it in second. Yeah. Okay. Oh, nope. Got to go back down to first. Like I, the, based on the incline and how it's changing, I can tell where I'm at and toward the last, you know, push I'll drive and start to kind of taste cauliflower in my mouth yeah. and the legs turn like bricks. And so, you know, you're getting past that, that threshold. But I think that certainly being able to self-regulate kind of in real time probably crosses over from what I'm doing to what you're doing and really makes a great or a average runner. 100%. Yeah, and I think the intuition for that is is where you really start to make gains because, mm -hmm. I mean, you can look at your running watch all day and, and see what pace you're running, but once you can kind of find the intuition and really tune into your body, mm -hmm. that's where I feel like I run the best. Uh, and I don't really follow training programs too closely 
and I'd really try to just listen to my body as much as possible. Um, like if I'm training for a specific race with a specific goal time, uh, I'll, I'll like the speed workouts or like the high intensity stuff. I'll do those pretty much to a T. But in terms of the like the easy miles and the volume of everything, that's where I really listen to my body because that's it's so easy to overtrain with running because it's yeah. especially if you've never done it or if you if you didn't grow up doing it and you're getting into it later in life like I did. Like I was 21 when I first got into it, and so. Is that considered late? Late in life would be 21? Uh, I mean, it depends on who you ask, I guess. But sure. Uh, I mean, I'm, I didn't do it in like middle school, high school, like a lot of, mm. you know, the, the people that are probably running like Olympic trials times for the marathon or something or like kept them like the Been Kenyans, training since they were since they were kids. The Kenyans, man, since they were born. Right. You ever follow uh, 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 James Perrette, Wild Hunt Conditioning? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's been on here a couple of times. He just did a post talking about a uh, uh, tribal cardiovascular techniques used for hunting and how these these guys in africa will outrun gazelle over a period of 75 to 100 miles they just will jog and keep it probably like you said around like a zone two and they will just keep this thing away from water and shade and they will run it until the gazelle literally can't move anymore and then they'll just run up and kill it and eat it and oh yeah his his stuff he's doing what what did he say he was running what kind of distance he was doing something insane he did a 500 mile 500 mile and he's i mean you see videos of him it's like he's just barely shuffling along but he just keeps going without stopping and i think it's incredible what the human body is actually capable of and how much more it's capable of than we you know think and it's wild you mentioned goggins that's kind of his that's kind of his cornerstone message i think is that your body's going to go so much further than you really think it is it's what's the limit of your mind more so than what's the limit of your body your body will go a lot further than you perceive your mind will quit way before it does yeah there's there's an element to our brains a lot of people call it the governor it's Mm -hmm. like a car like you have the governor set to okay don't let the rpms get this high Otherwise, the engine is going to blow up. Our bodies have that same thing. Our brains have that same thing. And so that's where you have brought byproducts like cramping or lactic acid or uh, even, like, you know, it's like constantly regulating your temperature. And if it goes past a certain point, it sends out these things to say, OK, you got to slow down. You got to stop. Otherwise, something's going to blow up. Basically, you get too far past homeostasis, essentially, and yeah. you're going to you're going to injure yourself or I don't know, your heart rate's going to go too high. and You're going to blow up of some kind. So, um yeah, but I think there are ways to tap into that, and uh, they, they've they've done a lot of studies on overriding that governor, and you probably don't want to do it all the time. You don't want to do it every day, mm-hmm. but you can almost always tap into that. And there's certain ways you can do that by like having a training partner, just simply somebody somebody running next to you, because mm-hmm. you you can tap into that little extra reserve tank of like, mm-hmm. okay, this guy's pushing me a little bit, I can push a little bit further, uh, or. I don't know, during a race, you have like crowds around you and you can feed off that energy or even just simply setting a goal and like looking at your watch and be like, okay, if I push a little bit harder here, I could probably hit this goal time. Having some kind of external thing can help you tap into that a yeah. little bit. But um, yeah, I think, I mean, Goggins talks about it. It's, he calls it the, the like 40% rule, I think, of when you think you're 40% there or, or when you think you're 100% there, you're really only 40% there. Mm-hmm. You've got another 60%. Yeah. Uh, and there's, there's just always a little something else you can tap into. Uh, when it comes to marathons, it's a little tricky because it's a long race, but it's, it's essentially a sprint, like, you know, six fifteen a mile can, is a, is a sprint. And so, um, that's where the line can be. Uh, it's, it's hard to go. It's easy to go too far past that line where mm-hmm. you, you bonk or hit the wall, but in something like an ultra, like what I'm doing on Saturday, the 50 miler, you're going so slow, relatively speaking, that you can go for so long. Like I have friends that do like 200 mile races, 300 mile races. The, the guy you're talking about runs, does 500 miles. So yeah. depends on the race and the effort level. Uh, the shorter the distance, the faster you're going, the the like less mental it is mm. and, and the more physical performance based it is. And then the longer the race, the more mental it is, I think. Yeah. Do you have a typical routine leading right up into the race like day before, two days before for every race or does it, vary depending on what type of race you're going to be running um it varies so like a marathon the days leading up will be a carb load okay so i have this calculator i use uh it's by featherstone nutrition it's just like a website and uh, you plug in your your height weight age or your race time and then it'll spit out uh how many days you should carb load how many carbs per day so for me it's for a marathon three days of carb loading usually like 600 grams of carbs a day what kind of carbs where are you getting it from pasta 
<laughs> I, I, from the office. Yeah. <laughs> you never see the dark. Yeah, we need carbo loads like five yeah. minutes before <laughs> the gun goes off. <laughs> that's a good point though, because oh. that's how people I think. <laughs> and he puts the, the cheese yeah. on it. <laughs> Remember how he starts the race yeah. with the 357 Magnum? Yeah. <laughs> and he fires it in the parking lot. That's the best show of all this time. That's the best show of all time. <laughs> and he's like running with his shirt out. <laughs> his his yeah. nipples yeah. are bleeding. Yeah. Chafing. <laughs> yes, behind Kevin to eliminate the wind resistance. Yeah. <laughs> Half of them go to the restaurant or something. Yeah, they yeah. chill and then they take a cab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's like air, every stereotype of running in that episode. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, no, yeah. I mean, that's actually a good point on the carb loading. It's, it's more of like a battery instead of a instead of like a gas tank is why i like to think about it it's like you plug in your phone to charge you can't you know shoot it up from five percent to 100 percent in a couple minutes you gotta let it sit for a couple hours Mm. whereas with your car like your gas tank you just show up put the nozzle in you're good two minutes later yeah uh your glycogen system your carb system is more like the battery where you gotta spend a couple days building Building it up up. to topping it up so that's where the the three-day carb load comes in um and the sources of it, I try to stick with whole foods as much as I can. So a lot of fruit, um, honey, sweet potatoes, rice. I try to avoid the processed stuff. I mean, processed stuff is usually very carb dense, but mm-hmm. it just makes you feel like shit, makes you feel heavy and slow. So I yeah. try to not do that too much. Um, and, and usually like of those three days, the first two days, that's where I'll eat the, the more dense stuff like a pasta or rice. And then the day before the race is usually the lighter stuff like fruit or honey or sweet potatoes or something. But how about hydration? Do you do a hyperhydration cycle in the days prior to a run? Yeah, so it's it's very similar to carb system. The the sodium stores you can build up those stores over a period of time. So uh, I'll do like two to three thousand milligrams of additional sodium per day. You just take it in table salt form with water. Uh, I actually have an electrolyte product that I started a couple months ago. So oh really? Yeah, it's called Switchback. So oh sick, dude! You got to get us some. I'll we'll, give, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll. Uh, I don't have any extra. I have a tub. You can like try a scoop. Sure. Um, but I'll, I'll send some to you. Either way, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll use it because we do, like I said, we hike and around here, I mean, you're you're coming in at a really, really good time to do a race in Arizona. Give it another 60 days and Arizona turns into a furnace. Now yeah. you're running into a whole nother list of problems that runners will have. Yeah, hydration's huge. I mean, that's that's one of the lowest hanging fruits to prevent cramping. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't have enough sodium, muscles can't perform properly. Nervous system can't perform properly. So, uh, yeah, so I'll sodium load. Again, like two to 3,000 milligrams per day, uh, lots of water. And then um, even the morning before the race, I will, I'll will i do like three or 4,000 milligrams of sodium. So to most people, that sounds like an insane amount of sodium, but it, it definitely works and it, it makes a big difference. You can actually boost your blood volume by sodium loading. So really? basically you have more blood flowing through your body, more yeah. more blood to for your muscles to access. So um, yeah, and for an ultra, like what I'm doing on Saturday, because it's such a long race, the intensity is a lot lower. Like I'll be zone two, zone three heart rate the whole time instead of a marathon where it's zone four, zone five. Uh, you don't have to be as strict on a lot of that stuff. Uh, even the carb loading, I won't really carb load for an ultra because you're, you're primarily fat burning because it's such a long race. So yeah, to answer your question, long, long way to go around it is uh, this depends on the race for, yeah. for how you prep. Um, one thing mentally though that I do before every race is I like to journal every day just on a consistent basis. But the, the days leading up to a race, I'll... I'll write out like, okay, there's going to come a point in this race where it gets hard, where I want to quit, where I'm asking myself like, why the fuck am I in the desert in Arizona <laughs> running 50 miles? Uh, That's me when I run a mile. Yeah. <laughs> why am I in the desert? <laughs> yeah. that, that, that point inevitably comes though in every race I've done. So oh, yeah. um, just writing out that answer for myself of like, okay, what am I going to tell myself? How am I going to handle that? And uh, that point always comes. So when I do get to that point, I'm like, okay. I prepared for this already. I'm, I'm good. Cause that's the point. I think if you show up not prepared, that's where you can quit or you can throw in the towel and be like, fuck this. Oh yeah. So. Yeah. This is ridiculous. Yeah. No one should be doing this. Yeah. Why am I doing this? Yeah. What are your thoughts on, um, listening to something, having something in your ear that you're listening to or nothing at all? Nothing at all. Okay. Nothing at all. That's me too. I used to listen to music or podcasts and now when I run, I just, I don't put anything in my ears and it, it allows me almost to like journal while I'm running. Yeah. It's very meditative. Yeah. Yeah. When I first got into running, I could not go for a run without music. Like, I don't know, some screamo death metal or mm-hmm. something or like Goggins podcast. Tell me I'm, I'm a bitch. I need to talk to that little bitch. <laughs> Who's going to carry the boats? <laughs> Who's going to carry the boats? <laughs> uh, I couldn't, I literally couldn't go for a run without that. And then uh, when I did my first half marathon, I saw in the, the like race description that you weren't allowed to wear headphones. So I was like, okay, mm-hmm. 
took that lesson from sports of practice how you play. So I started training without headphones. And the first run I went out, I was like, oh, this is actually pretty nice. You mm -hmm. can think. The only thing you can hear is your feet hitting the ground and your breath. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very meditative. So yeah, now it's, uh, yeah, no headphones or anything. And that brings up another point. Is it good to listen to your breath? And, and does that send some type of signal to you to either go down a zone or up a zone? Um, Honestly, I don't pay attention to my breath a whole lot. I just kind of do whatever feels natural. Uh, when I'm doing easy runs like zone two heart rate training, uh, I try and nose breathe as much as I can. That's kind of yeah. a good mm. a good test. Give it a mouth tape. Yeah, I sleep with it every night. What about while you run? You ever do that? Not while I run, no. Someone been someone said we should try that or challenged me to. I'm, I'm like I, I don't know. I, maybe sure I guess. What I've been doing actually, I tried it for the first time, not on the way up, but on the way down from Camelback. I threw a piece of tape on and went down and that was hard just that running with only your nose and restricted only to your nose because i do it when i sleep too first of all i wouldn't advise anybody even try it unless they've been wearing it to sleep for maybe a year i don't know because it really is a you have to have a truly dialed in understanding of what your breath work is what your heart rate is how you're feeling because if you get to a point where you need to pant and you literally can't that thing's gonna it's not like you're gonna but you're gonna it's gonna come off you're gonna rip it off there's no way you're gonna be able to make it in an ultra by only breathing through your nose i would assume uh, yeah i mean theoretically if you're zone two heart rate or lower you should be able to just nose breathe because mm -hmm. you're, you're pure aerobic but not high intensity probably no definitely not yeah you can't it's just yeah not. you'd have to breathe through your mouth mm -hmm. um i mean that's where you know anaerobic versus aerobic would come into play if, you, if you're pure aerobic so zone two or lower you should be able to go to nasal breathing only mm -hmm. but uh yeah yeah that's i i think that's probably the biggest mistake most people make when they first get into running is mm -hmm. they run way too fast i mean that's what i did my first year I'd run a mile as hard as I could. Heart rate was like 180, 190 the entire time. Now, when I go out for a run, 80% of the time, heart rate's like 130s, 140s. Mm -hmm. Rarely gets above 150s on easy days. Uh, but it, it took a long time to get to that point um, to where, like, where my pace is at now at those heart rates. So wherever that pace is for you, like I encourage people to just not even look at your watch uh, in terms of the pace and just look at your heart rate and the time. Like Our bodies don't know what a mile is. Our bodies don't know what eight minutes a mile is, but they'd know how hard they're working. So heart rate and then for how long. So just how, however, duration, wherever the time is. Duration. So duration times effort, I think are the, is the, the equation you should follow when you're trying to build a good aerobic foundation. Mm -hmm. Getting, go ahead. Um, I was, someone that's like a novice who doesn't do like marathons or ultra marathons, but they want to get into running and they want to improve their time. I guess I'm asking this question for myself. Um, how do you recommend going about like finding out how many times a week to run? And then at what pace are you running each time you go out? Yeah, I would start with a run walk combo. Okay. So start with like, I don't know, a five minute warm up walk, run for a minute, two minutes, just real easy, just like a little shuffle basically. Uh, so your heart rate doesn't jack up too high. And then walk for a minute or two, run for a minute or two, just kind of do that that combo until you get comfortable with that and it feels easy. And then I would bump up the ratio of, of run to walk. So maybe run for five minutes, walk for a minute, five minutes, walk for a minute. And then to get to the point of, okay, I'm running for a mile and I walk for a minute. Until you ultimately get to the point of you can just run without your heart rate skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I'd recommend to people. Uh, do you guys know Mark Bell at all? Yeah. I was just, I just did his podcast a few weeks ago and, uh, he started doing, he calls it like landmark training or landmark running uh -huh. where he'll walk. He'll just go out for a walk just like normal. And then when it feels good to run, he'll run from like here to the stop sign or here to the light post. And then he just does that. And then over time, it takes a long time to build up that foundation. But if you're trying to really optimize and, you know, not get injured and build up that strong foundation. I think that's probably the best way to go about it. Uh, Rather than just going out and running a mile as fast as you can all at once. Exactly. Which is almost certainly what everybody would do. Yeah. If somebody thought they were about to train for a long distance run, the very first thing they would probably do is start with a mile. Yeah. Be like, all right, let me see what my mile time is. Let me run as fast as I possibly can. And even on a treadmill, the first time you do that, that's daunting. Like yeah. every single time the, uh, uh, the, what's, what's the, uh, the, the challenge for veterans day, the, um, the Murph. Yeah. Every yeah. single time the Murph comes back around, that is the, by the way, that is one of the hardest <laughs> workouts it's still to this day it's brutal i don't even care if you're an endurance guy or not if it's like run a mile as fast as you can what is it do you remember the, the can you pull that up what is the murph i know it's 
air squats, pull-ups, push-ups, a mile at the beginning and a mile at the end. But I don't, do you know what it is? Yeah, it's a 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, and then 300 squats. And, and then separated by mile, mile. Yeah, so mile mm-hmm. to bookend it. Mile yeah. to bookend it. And yeah. there's no, I, the, the hardest part about it is it's not like, you can do them in any order you want. The three individual, the, the, the squats, the pull-ups and the push-ups you can do in any way you want. Knowing which direction to take those is going to impact the time of that workout. But that's still to this day. I mean, that is one of the hardest. I don't even remember the fastest time I've ever done it in. Well, I think you convinced me to do the uh, the weighted vest the first time I tried it. That's so right. That was, yeah, that's the, the true way. That was not. You're with a. It's a twenty pounds. Is yeah. It, a twenty pound vest, which a twenty pound vest for a was it a hundred pull ups? Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot yeah. of pull ups <laughs> with a twenty pound vest. That is a lot of pull ups no matter what you're doing. Yeah. And that's but yeah that type of that type of training is typically I think what people go toward if they think they're about to run a, a marathon they'd be like all right I'm gonna start running as fast as I can as often as I can yeah and obviously what you're saying is that that's wrong uh yeah I mean it's just the, the I mean the the best way to get better at running is to run more and the only way to run more is to not be health or to not be hurt and be mm-hmm. healthy so uh whatever you can like the, what I tell people is train as much as you can uh within your own means like within your your current state of fitness I guess uh that's maybe not the best way to put it, but like you're training for a marathon. Uh, you don't need to go run 26 miles every weekend. Obviously it's like, you're not, your body's not ready for that. Yeah. And so just really easing into it, building that strong foundation. And again, most people that are like hobby joggers, quote unquote, sure. getting into running in their thirties, forties, whatever, their bodies are not used to the pounding and the impact of running. And so that's where taking that slow approach of the run walk combo probably helps. Um, this is a good transition. Yeah this particular point that we're on to recovery. I've seen your content. I've seen you doing the contrast therapy, the ice bath, just like we do here. What role does that play in your opinion with longevity? If someone's going to be doing this, I mean, running, especially distance running, that's a, that's a high impact activity running on flat ground. It's just going to wear and tear the joints. If you're not careful, what is it you're doing? Oh, there you go. Perfect. What is it that you do for your recovery protocol and what, what percentage of it would you say is contrast therapy? Yeah, I mean, recovery is just as important, obviously, as, as the training itself. And with any sport, I feel like the faster you can recover, the more you can train. And the more you can train, the, the quicker you make the gains. And so uh, your recovery is huge. I think sleep is probably the number one thing mm-hmm. I try to prioritize. Uh, I always get minimum seven hours of sleep if I can help it. Uh, try to shoot for eight or nine hours even if possible. Uh, and then... I think active recovery is probably the second best thing. So I'll hop on a bike, do like a 30, 45 minute spin out, just super easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, just gets the blood flow and gets all the lactic acid cleared out. Um, walking, I think is probably the next best thing. I love walking. I'll walk the dogs, just go for a 30, 45 minute walk. I'll like throw a weight vest on sometimes because it's, mm-hmm. you get the heart rate up a little bit. You get the, the movement. I would say motion is lotion, just getting the body moving. And I think, uh, if I wake up and I'm like a little tight, a little sore and I go for a walk, like I come back, everything feels loosened up. Everything feels good because yeah. it's just such a low impact form of movement. Same with swimming or biking. Um, so yeah, I'd say sleep, active recovery. Uh, the, the contrast therapy is great. I do that maybe three, four times a week, sauna, cold plunge, that kind of stuff. Nice. And then um, how do you how do you run it? Do you do I mean, how how many minutes do you do? Three, three. Do you do? Yeah, I'll do uh, like 15 to 20 minutes in the sauna. Uh, two to three minutes in the plunge and do that like two or three times. So you'll go hot to cold. Yeah. I, nice. I, I usually, I'll go hot, cold, hot, cold and finish in the hot. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot easier to finish in the hot. Yeah. It's a <laughs> lot harder to finish in that tub, yeah. no matter what it is. Yeah. And I, cause I'll do like one time a week. I like to try to do a 10 minute ice consistent, like all the way through and then recover in the sauna. Minutes. 10 minutes, Damn. one time per week. How cold? 35. So ours is 35. It, 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 they vary. There's also a it, it, the new one we're getting where I'm excited for. It it gets only to, I think it gets to 39 or 38, but it's got a circulation feature and the water's moving. That's which different. All of us here are going to be new to that. Have you ever done a circulation ice tub? I mean, I've sat in a river. That counts. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> what about you? Have you done? Yeah. No? Yeah. I never have. I have. I can come. Yeah. All right. I've gone in the ocean. Fair point. But I've never gone in an ice bath that actually has that feature. And apparently it kicks it up a notch and makes it 
you, you, where your body can't build up a thermal layer, thus exactly. your difficulty level rises. Definitely. So that time may be impacted by that. I don't know. But what I do is a 10 minute ice, 10 minute sauna, one time per week. And then two or three times per week on top of that, I'll do what you do, or I'll start sauna. I'll mm-hmm. get like 15, 20 minutes at probably 200 degrees and just sweat it out because it's important to appreciate the distinction and the difference between those two. 10 minute ice bath starting out is a whole different set of benefits as opposed to a 10 minute sauna starting out. And I think the 10 minute sauna starting out, you can do a lot more. I wouldn't advise anybody to do a 10 minute ice bath three, four times a week. Yeah. I just wouldn't. I, th- I think it's probably better to do it once. But the 15 to 20 minute sauna followed by the ice bath, if you end on that ice bath, it's just daunting. Even three minutes. Like, that's what I'll typically do is 15 minute sauna, three minute ice, two or three times a week. Have you heard Huberman talk about uh, not ice bathing after a workout because it kills hypertrophy? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So how do you adjust the, do you, do you do it whenever? Or like, do you pay much attention to that? Yeah, no, I, I, I do. I've, I've heard that. And that was, I mean, Huberman definitely brought it up and definitely repopularized it. That study that science that he's referring to if if i'm correct and i I haven't seen the video of him talking about it but it referred to an old study wherein they took athletes they had them do um a lower body workout of some time of some kind then they put them into an ice bath and then basically progressed that same exact model over a month Mm -hmm. and then another group of athletes that did a workout and didn't do the ice bath and they monitored the gains they made the get the group without the ice bath doing better over a linear periodization of a month i don't all the way buy into that for several reasons the first being first the first and most obvious being not everybody is always training just for muscle growth and for muscle gain there are other reasons to be doing it i mean aerobic endurance there's a great one i mean you can be training for a lot of other reasons other than hey i want to build i want to pack on muscle that's not everybody's goal and the contrast therapy has an entire side of benefits that have little or nothing to do with your physical health that's inherent in the activity no doubt but your mental your ability to a perfect couldn't be a better example of what you were talking about about shutting off the governor you know getting into a situation where you have an external stimulus that is inherently negative and you as the participant being able to silence that voice, push past that threshold and be your own governor, that's a really, really beneficial little activity for people to take part in two, three, four times a week. Now, should they be doing it right after a workout? I wouldn't do it every single day right after you lift, just on the off chance that the studies that have come out are even a percentage accurate. But if you're doing it, maybe once or twice a week following your workout if you if you're somebody who likes to go to the gym and your gym has a plunge you like to go do your lift and then go get in the plunge for three minutes you're gonna be fine and almost always this is the other part of this whole equation that bothers me the people who are especially online who are yelling at you for doing it or telling oh this is gonna mess with your gains (laughs) nine times out of ten those people aren't they're not doing it, nor are they training, nor do they have any idea what they're... They heard someone say it on a podcast once, so they feel they can weigh in on it. Most of the time, they don't have any firsthand experience. I mean, I've I've done training and contrast therapy in u- in unison for over eight and a half years now. And it, and it dates back all the way to where I first started in an internship where they were doing it with the highest level athletes in the NFL. So I think people are getting too caught up in... Just do it, is my answer yeah. to that. I'm like, bud, whoever it is that's talking to me, I tell them, look, just start doing it. Try to get 11 minutes a week in the ice bath. I don't care when you do it. I don't care how you do it. You can divide it up however you want. If you can get 11 minutes in the ice bath every week, you're probably going to get the benefits of that cold therapy. Beyond that, you can just go listen to Huberman. Maybe he'll give you a nice scientific analysis that'll make you feel better about yourself. <laughs> Other than that, I love it. I love that. Yeah. yeah I uh, I like the mental side of things, of the sauna and, and ice bath. Mm-hmm. Uh, I find the first like 30 to 45 seconds of an ice bath. Like, I'm curious to hear your guys' thoughts. Like, do you get that, that sensation where your, your brain almost shuts off and you, you have like blackout, not fully blackout, but your, your brain is like almost not coherent. Like if somebody asks you a really complicated question, you like wouldn't be able to answer it because your brain is just like not working right. Mm-hmm. You guys ever experienced that? I'm just like yeah. breathless usually in the <laughs> whoo, like trying to trying to maintain my breath or establish a breath. Yeah, that it's because it's that shock, right? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a fight or flight response that gets triggered, and that that same uh, feeling 
I think is, is very in line with what I feel during the end of a marathon or, or when a race starts getting really hard. It's that fight or flight response. Mm-hmm. It's the governor talking. It's like, okay, this is uncomfortable. We should probably stop. But the other part of your brain's like, no, we're good. We can keep going. That's yeah. the fight. Um, and so trying to overcome that and figure out a way to work through that and calm your mind down. Mm-hmm. That's what I honestly do the ice bath and sauna more for that reason than mm-hmm. even the physical benefits. If it, if there's physical benefits along with it, that's great. But I just love the mental side of things too. That's why I like running so much. Like, yeah, it's great for physical health. And mm-hmm. I mean, marathons arguably may not be the best for your physical health uh, mm-hmm. uh, because of just the sheer volume of training and, and your endocrine system takes a hit and everything. So um, your joints. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I mentioned that earlier. It is a high impact activity. Yeah. And, and so to train for it yeah. also high impact. Yeah. But the, the mental benefits, I feel like make it all worth it. Mm, good. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's, um, it's definitely something to be said even outside of athletics, the mental benefits of especially contrast therapy. I, I mean, people with PTSD, insomnia, anxiety, uh, they've, they've used it for, I mean, veterans who've come back with, you know, wartime experiences that have messed with their heads. The, being able to get, because there's not too many, there's not too many activities. And, and this is where I would separate contrast therapy from almost any other form of physical activity because contrast therapy is not a high impact activity. There's no impact in it. You, you are just literally sitting your ass in a giant tub of frozen water. But it is going to put you in possibly the most uncomfortable state that you've ever been. And if you've, and if you're somebody who's never done it before and you've tried it for the very first time, most likely you've never been that uncomfortable in your entire life. And that's a setting where you can learn a lot about yourself. And hopefully if you are dealing with some of the mental problems that I just mentioned, you can figure out a way to work around that by learning how to work around something as simple as a cold water exposure. Well, maybe that makes you a little bit more forgiving the next time someone cuts you off in traffic and you don't feel the need to leap out of your car. That sort of thing is also what I really have come to appreciate it. The the fact that um we're even we're working on something actually. We're gonna we're creating a uh, military first responder program, a protocol. Our therapist is actually she specializes in PTSD tra- treatment, and we're gonna work, put together a combination of contrast therapy, work with her in a you know the deep tissue massage setting and then couple that with the the float the sensory deprivation as well which interestingly enough has also had uh, a lot of um ties to help with ptsd mm-hmm. recovery all the mental side of things that uh that comes from that that's an interesting one and, and we talked about this a little bit before you you came in here that is it, it is something you've done before or have you ever tried it the sensory deprivation no i've never done it i've heard a lot of good things but i've never tried it personally you really should you want to try it Dude, I might. But yeah. while, while I'm here, I'd love to. Oh, heck yeah. Let's do it, man. I'll, I'll throw we'll throw you in afterwards. It's a very, um, it's new to me and that's fun. I, I love, because you do this enough and you, you, you get to a point where you feel like you've experienced everything. Um, that to me is what excites me the most is when someone introduces me to something that I'm totally unfamiliar with. Yeah. Sensory deprivation, I've really come to appreciate. It's completely different than contrast therapy when it comes to a both the physical benefits but the mental benefits it's much more um you know what it is i feel that you're much you're much less present than you are inside of an ice bath in an ice bath it seems like you've never been more present (laughs) in your life that's a true statement (laughs) like whatever it is like like, oh you're bummed about your mortgage well that doesn't matter right now you're in an ice bath whatever it is that you're you know annoyed with in life vanishes and it can really help you in that time and place. But what I think the sensory deprivation does is if you treat it like your own therapy session, you can try to work through some of those problems on your own without having them. It's a it's a poor analogy, but it's the only one that comes to my head. It feels like the ice bath is sort of a temporary band-aid for those problems that makes them vanish immediately in the setting where you're at. And that can bring relief. But for the sensory deprivation, it's almost as if you are confronted with those problems because all you have is your thoughts and your breath. You're underwater. You have no light. You have no sound. You have no feeling because you're totally buoyant in that water. You are forced to confront whatever those issues are. And and for me, it can be uh, maybe there's a, a, a work-related dilemma that I haven't been able to really kind of work out or a personal dilemma. That's a big one for me. Anything where I find that my maybe my actions aren't really in line with my ethics, uh, I want to... Uh, 
pray. I want to talk to God. I want to find a space where I can actually, I don't have anything, no phone, no, no external stimulus of any kind. That's what I've really come to appreciate about that. That's amazing. I love that. Yeah. That's uh, the presence thing is what I, I find the most of the running too. Uh, it, I would relate it more maybe to the ice bath analogy of like, you have to be very present. Uh, maybe for like the higher intensity runs or like during a race or something, cause you're, you're the efforts higher. Like, yeah. uh, the intensity is much higher, like an ice bath. It's very uncomfortable. Uh, so you have no choice, but to be present. And if you try to let your mind wander, it very quickly snaps back to what you're doing. But on like the easy runs, like the, you know, 80% of the time, just zone two, that's where I find to be more meditative, maybe more like the float tank. Cause mm -hmm. it's, it's an easy effort. You're working hard a little bit but it's uh you have a lot of time to just think and meditate so there's i mean i love running obviously but that i love it for for that mental reason because you get both benefits of the presence and the meditation aspect which mm -hmm. i guess to some degree they're both forms of meditation yeah but uh different different forms of meditation definitely yeah so talk to me about what it is that you are are you coaching people in running do you have a protocol that you are giving to your athletes or to your clients what exactly do you do with running from a like a professional standpoint yeah so i i do a few things one uh is content so trying to uh either entertain inspire or educate people through content uh so i like read a lot of books listen to podcasts just through my own experiences trying to share that knowledge as much as i can with people mm -hmm. uh and i'm not really teaching maybe the elite runner but somebody like myself who's just like maybe was an athlete growing up but now they're getting into running or somebody who wants to run their first marathon uh so a lot of like newer beginner type of runners or people trying to qualify for boston or something um so that's the content side of things and then uh i do coaching uh, it's all remote so I was working with a lot of people about a year ago. It was like 60, 70 people one-on-one -on -one, and that was just too much. Um, so I cut it back to like 15, 20 people now. It's a lot more manageable, uh, but it's all remote. So primarily again, same group of people, people trying to run their first marathon, maybe run their first ultra marathon, uh, qualify for Boston. And it's it's uh, mostly the programming side of things. Well, that's part of it is the programming. So I'll give them a marathon program or training program to follow. But I think the, one of the most important things. Oh, very cool. Yeah, this is my Oh, mind. you got an app and everything. Yeah, so I have a training app too. Nice, dude. Um, Strong. It's called Stronger, <laughs> Faster, Further. Yep. I love the logo, the arrow. Yeah. Yeah, I dig that. Uh, but the uh, what I've come to learn with the one-on-one -on -one coaching is as much as it, as it is the programming, uh, I think maybe that's originally why people come to me. It ends up being more like almost a therapist. <laughs> of like, okay, if people are on our calls, we're not even talking about running anymore. We're talking about like some life thing they're going through, yeah. uh, which is cool because it's like, it's a greater impact. Like, I mean, if these people, if they hit their time in their marathon, does it really matter? If I hit my time in the marathon, does it really matter? Not really, but the ultimate goal is just to be better human. And so if I can help people, you know, do that through the means of running, then I like that aspect of it. Um, and then the other main thing I do is the, the electrolyte company. So it's called switchback. Mm -hmm. Um, we just launched that my business partner and I in August, and it's kind of one part, uh, endurance fuel, it's the hydration aspect, but also we lean into the community side pretty heavily. So we do a lot of in-person events like group runs. Uh, we're doing a group run tomorrow out here in, uh, in Tempe. So trying to activate people as much as we can in person, because mm -hmm. to me the the, my favorite memories in my life from my, my most, uh, like cherished moments are when I'm being active and I'm with like-minded people doing something hard, community. the community aspect. And so we try to bring people together through that and provide a platform for that. So, um, yeah, we, we have a ton of events coming up that we have planned. So, um, yeah, so the coaching, the content and the, and community. the community and, and the electrolytes. Yeah. I love that. That's yeah. outstanding. Something you said that's, you know, easy to brush past, but important to acknowledge. It's very, very cool that you take, the remote coaching and in such an intimate way that that's something that is grossly ignored by coaches, especially online coaches. Uh, it's, uh, it's something we really haven't. I mean, like I said, before we started this, we're about nine years old. We are launching our online training presence as we speak. Literally our first challenge is ongoing right now for the first nine years of the company. I, I strongly advocated for in-person services just because there, in my opinion, was always a missing element of intimacy, a missing element of integrity. A lot of these online coaches just seem to be 
grabbing the money. They didn't yeah. really, you know, it was all a volume game. It didn't matter to them whether or not anyone got anything of value whatsoever. As long as they ended up with you in their community or, or as a client, that's really all that seemed to matter. So it's very refreshing and important to acknowledge you know, you taking the time to, you know, even if it's being a therapist, I mean, just a lot of times that's, I, I tell some people, really, I slept through sports psychology in college. I really wish I hadn't because you do learn that, Hey, maybe 1% of your conversations in the gym or in training are going to be regarding sports, you know, training. You're probably going to be talking about, Hey, you know, my, my wife is mad at me or my kids did this or my, that's going to be, yeah. a, you have to be able to be a person with a person and have that type of interpersonal relationship. Otherwise, you're not going to be a successful coach, whether in person or online. Yeah, my, my ultimate goal with each person I work with is to, as quickly as possible, like have them graduate from me and move on to where they don't need a coach. And like they figure out, I mean, some people like the accountability. Some people like having somebody handle the programming. Like I still work with a coach when I have a big race coming up. Sure. I, I just like having the team aspect almost. But I kind of like to treat it that way as like once they're like, okay, I don't I don't need to pay you anymore. And it's, you know, not for like, oh, you, you suck as a coach, but like, I, yeah, I don't you, think I need you anymore. Like, that makes me feel good because it's like, OK, I did my job then. Heck yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the right perspective to have too. anytime you or one of your students gets to a point where they're like, hey, listen, thank you so much for everything you did. I think I'm good. Yeah. You know, that's not a that's not a problem. That's a good thing. That's something to really celebrate. Yeah. From a business standpoint, it's like, oh, you want that recurring customer. Mm -hmm. But if it's if that's your intent i don't think you're doing it for the right reasons obviously yeah so definitely yeah, yeah you gotta you gotta make you gotta make money as a professional in anything but it's it's important to remember that if you are providing a service where someone should be able to outgrow you we'll do everything you can to make sure that they can don't hold on to it just because you want to have a client yeah no that's that's very well said if somebody wanted to work with you where would they go how would they sign up uh via my website we just had pulled up jeremymiller.io there it is. Uh, it's on like the a, link. Okay, perfect. So, so link in your bio from Instagram for those of you guys yep. coming from social. I think it's uh, one of those links on there. It should be my website. Um, Training plans. Oh, lotion right that's there. great. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that's great. The little animated guy. Yeah, the lotion guy. That's it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay, so the web. Oh, there it is. What did you click, Jake, to, to, to get to that point? So this is just the um, the homepage under the supplements. But yeah, perfect. jeremymiller.io. So start training today. Awesome. Yeah, I've got some uh, like training programs on there, like PDFs you can buy for marathons, mm -hmm. uh, half marathons. I have like a couch to 5K if you like, you know, never ran in your life and you want to go do a 5K. I've got that on there. Um, another huge part, I guess we haven't talked about too much, is like the strength training side of things. I think mm -hmm. that's equally as important as the running portion. Mm. If you're if you're trying to get faster as a runner, I think you should. You don't, you don't spend as much time strength training, but treat it with equal importance. Definitely. Uh, because again, the injury prevention, uh, I mean, the muscular endurance that goes into it, like, I don't know the percentage of people that cramp during their first marathon. I'm sure it's over 50%, but that can be mitigated by strength training and lifting and just having the proper muscular endurance and the muscular strength to get through something like a marathon. Um, <clears throat> and I think the more, the longer the races, the more important that is like an ultra, like I, I, most ultras, ultra runners are a little bit bigger, more muscular, stronger because mm -hmm. you're going through the mountains. You need the, the leg strength and power. So, uh, I mean, you could do a, a 5k, 10k, whatever, without maybe quite as much. You still need to have some power there as well, but of course, uh, the, the, the muscular endurance side is just as important, I think. And your programs, you go through that as well. You do the strength training, you do yeah. the whole thing all, all pretty much all the way through for the one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, just like a case by case basis some people don't need it mm -hmm. um but that's that's probably the thing i think most runners neglect is the strength training and that's why so many people get hurt i think as soon as i started consistently lifting and, and lifting intentionally mm -hmm. uh so like single leg stuff lifting heavier uh that's where the injuries kind of went away from running that's something you mentioned mark bell that's something he does very well yeah i mean from a background as a power lifter oh wow Oh, that's really cool, man. Yeah. That's really cool to see yeah, the so, difference between that. Yeah. My first marathon that was on the left 2022, when I tried to break three hours, I thought I had the mindset of like, okay, I got to be lighter. I got to be, you know, it's less weight to move. Uh, but I was kind of always battling some kind of injury. Yeah. It was just felt weak all the time. And then fast forward a year and a half to 2023 ran 16 minutes faster in the marathon Yeah, and, and weighed 15 pounds heavier. Wow. I say that strength training is 
it's the great enhancer. It enhances activity. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. Running, yoga, swimming. There is not a single activity on this planet that strength training will not help and improve. 100%. And that's also why I, 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 you get every single excuse or every single, I mean, women don't want to get bigger. Or, you know, runners don't want to be heavier. Everybody has a reason why they think they shouldn't do it. The truth of the matter is you just need to do it. I don't care yeah. what you're doing or how old you are or what gender you are or what sport you're in. Strength training is, if I could only do one thing, honestly, it would be that. I would give up hiking. I would give up swimming. I would give up just about everything else and do strength training alone if that was the option I was given. Yeah, bone density, yes. lig ligaments, like all, yeah. Yeah. There's so much. Yeah. It's, 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 it's crazy. And, and you are hearing a lot of guys, especially older guys. Uh, one of our guests was Rudy Cudlub. He's the one of the CEOs of Kabuki Strength. The guy's 74, something like that. And he's his squat bench dead. He's like well over a thousand. Wow. And, and it, it's <laughs> world record. World record holder. That's crazy. And, and he's, I mean, he has the bone density of like a 31 year old, they said. They took a DEXA scan of his body. And that's from strength training. That's something that you can't get from running and you can't get from Pilates and you can't get from yoga. All of those things are great, but those are activities. Yeah. And it's important to distinguish the difference between training and activities. Yep. 100%. Yeah. The And if any runners are listening to this or people that are wanting to, to optimize shrink training for the purpose of becoming a better runner, mm -hmm. uh, despite popular belief, you actually want to lift high weight, low reps. A lot of runners think, oh, I'm training for endurance. I need to do high reps, low yeah, weight, yeah. and just rep it out like 15, Amen. 20 reps. But it actually, uh, this is a good book recommendation for people that want to learn more about the, the like science part of running. It's called The Science of Running. Mm -hmm. And uh, it talks about this specifically of you should do rep ranges of like two to five reps, super heavy, mm -hmm. uh, because you're squat getting- Squat bench dead. Squat bench you dead. You should basically become a power lifter. Literally, yeah. If you want to be a better runner, be a power lifter. Yeah. I don't squat a whole lot. I'll do some like goblet squats, but deadlift. I deadlift heavy twice a week. Like, like you're yeah. speaking my lingo. I mean, everybody in this room has a terrible squat. Have <laughs> yeah. you ever have you ever worked with any specialty bars for squatting? Like a uh, like the transformer bar, the safety bar with the, mm -hmm. the straps and everything. That might help. And and I can show you that when we get in there. It, yeah. it, there are certain ways to mediate the shittiness of squatting because it, it. I mean, it's an axial loaded movement. We all need to be doing them. But a lot of us. I mean, if you have a shoulder impingement, if you've got, everybody's got a reason why most likely squats can and will hurt you if you do them wrong. So finding the right equipment is like finding the right tools to build a, a, a bunk bed or something. Like you need to have the right tools in order to keep going. It's like the slant board. Yeah. We just did a, we just did a workout, not, three days ago where we did goblet squats but we did them on a slant yeah. board it's like at a what, what what degree do you think that's at it's like what like 45 degrees it's a 45 degree slant board somewhere around there with that transformer bar pushing the knees well past the toes and going ass to grass yeah. but the weight was maybe like one plate if that but those are the tools that without those tools you'd be kind of like well all right i'll just try to do a goblet squat and it would be about half as efficient right. so when it comes to strength training a lot of the times it is about knowing what to use yeah yeah i uh my biggest impairment with squatting or biggest uh hindrance is my ankle mobility i've just always had really shitty ankles that's not surprising given probably, that you run as much probably as you from do. running yeah. uh and so simply just like elevating my heels like, you know, something like maybe not to the extent of a slant board, but just like throwing some like 10 pound plates under my heels makes a huge difference. Makes it feel way more natural. And uh, if, if you've yeah. got if you've got ankle immobility, I got a whole routine for that. Yeah. I because of hiking and I have bad ankles. Both of us do. We have genetically bad ankles. So I've got and I've got a I roll my ankle more times than I could count growing up. Yeah. So I developed an entire self-applied protocol using it's called I, I, I combine equipment I use a power plate which is the vibration machine you've seen for lymphatic drainage yeah. and I combine it with a thing called it's called a slack block it's a basically a three and a half inch piece of foam with a block on top of it that moves like a slack line would if you were to put it you know how the hippies do it between yeah. the palm trees that's what this is meant to do <laughs> you put that on top of the on top of the block and it vibrates and I oh, go oh. through I go through flexion and extension eversion and inversion with my ankles interesting and i have not rolled again knock knock on wood sorry to the audio i have not rolled my ankle in over three and a half years wow and i and i run and, and you you when we were out hiking last time you said you i like, did semi rolled it yes, but I you did. can recover it's from that fine yeah. I, I i stepped wrong and i as we were going down because i was wearing shoes that i don't typically wear which were high elevation shoes because of this particular hike i rolled it and i felt it go and i was like it's fine 
And I and I and I brought it to his attention. I was like, "Yeah, I, this is so funny. I, I haven't rolled my ankle in over three years. I just rolled it, but I'm fine. It's totally good I, because I've been going through this. And a lot of it, there's some knowledge to that as well. I mean, training in preparation for injury is how you avoid injuries actually becoming a problem. Right. You're all gonna. I mean, you're, you're gonna get hurt. I mean, if you're doing marathons, you're, something's gonna bug you by the time that's done. But if you've worked out in a specific way to prepare yourself, if you've if you've worked with your knees, you've worked with your ankles and your hips, which is primarily where you're gonna run into the those are the three areas you'll probably run into problems. Yep. That's gonna help mediate that as time goes on. Yeah, that's that's why I do uh, I do a ton of lunges, a lot of box step ups, Bulgarian split squats, because each one of those you have the flexion in your hips, knees, and ankles all all within the same movement, and you can do that under load. You ever do any offset training? What do you mean by that? So offset training, I love. It's where you, um, there's a lot of, in, guys get ridiculed for doing it, but it really is incredible. So if you take, for example, like a single leg squat, you can do that with two dumbbells, which would be just regular. You've mm-hmm. got two 40 pound dumbbells, whatever, and they're even. If I were to take, say, for example, a barbell, and instead of grabbing in the center of the barbell, I had you shift over to one side. Oh. So now the barbell is weighted or, or a mace, you know, because a mace yeah. is counter loaded. The offset training it may be a third as heavy as those dumbbells are together, but because it's imbalanced while you're doing a single leg activity, I find that it's a much better yield, especially when it yeah. comes to hip mobility, the strength of your knees, all that stuff. If you do offset training, that's a really good recommendation. Interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I do. I try and do as much as I can with a kettlebell, which you get maybe some of that, but not to the extent of that, obviously. But yeah, I try to not use dumbbells because I feel like the center of gravity is even more uh it's stronger with a dumbbell versus mm-hmm. even just a kettlebell. You get a little bit of that that offset, definitely. Guess, but uh, yeah. yeah, I gotta look into the the full offset with the I'll, I'll, the mace or something. I'll show you yeah. some stuff, man. Yeah, but hey, thanks for coming on, bro. That was a lot of fun. Thanks for having a really me. good episode. Yeah, seriously, I got a lot out of that one. Yeah, that was a blast. Yeah. Hopefully, Appreciate it. I love it. Thanks for having yeah. me on. Of course, bud. All right, Eli, we'll stop it right there. Thank you guys so much for watching that episode of Becoming the 1% Podcast. If you like the content and you want to see more of it, hit the like and subscribe. Activate that notification bell as well. We really appreciate it. If you guys want to see more of it, we actually have the Becoming the 1% Instagram and the podcast is available on Spotify. For our socials, we have Strict Vision Athletics on Instagram. We have it on YouTube and we have it on TikTok.